Good morning, everyone. Thanks all for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Betty Janot, uh, VP of Marketing over here at Solo.io. And today we're very lucky to have um, the team from Park Mobile here to talk about their journey in uh, migrating to Kubernetes, cloud, and glue. Um, these end user stories are some of the best because they are practitioners like yourselves, organizations that are um, adopting technology and maybe and may have gone through um, a lot of the same things that you're looking to embark on. So uh, this is this is a treat to have the whole team here um, tell the story. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. This session is going to be recorded and so it'll be available for replay. Should have that up by the end of the week so you can share it with your colleagues. Um, we will be taking Q&A so please go ahead and type in questions into the Q&A or the chat window as the speakers are presenting. What we will do is address all the questions at the very end. Um, Matt, if you could advance the slide, please. Oh, it's, it hasn't refreshed for me yet. Um, yeah, it's uh, hanging up here, Betty, hold on. Okay. <laughs> All go. right, so this is everyone you see um, here. I just introduced myself. I'll be here to moderate. If there's any technical things that come up, sound, what have you, um, please make sure to tap in the chat, put that in the chat and I'll get that handled um, with our presenters. Um, today, your speakers are Matt Ball, uh, CTO of Park Mobile. We have, and then in the room there, um, with the lovely background and all the fun, um, fun, cool collection of swag there, all of our cloud yep. friends. We've got Chris Solomon, um, who's the Director of Software and Reliability Engineering. Rafael Ramirez um, leads um, SRE, and Anthony Malika, Senior SRE. So uh, Matt's going to kick it off um, with some background on Park Mobile as a company, what they're doing, um, and then the team in the room there is going to talk um, in great detail about um, how they're working with the various components of technology and ready for all of your questions. Now, to you, Matt. Betty, you can hear me well? I can hear you great. Good. Thanks for having us. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce myself, Matt Ball, uh, CTO here at Park Mobile. I've been with the company a little over 18 months now. And I think the story you're gonna hear today is truly a success story for us as a business, but with that success has put a lot of pressure on us to make sure the infrastructure and the applications behind our story can keep up with what's going on in our business. And the moral of the story, and I think you'll see towards the end, is we went to solve some of these technical challenges, finding the right partner and the right solutions to help us solve those challenges uh, is really, at the end of the day, part of our, uh, you know, our recipe for success. So thank you for having us. And I also just want to quickly thank my team for getting us to the point where we can confidently have this discussion and celebrate some of our successes. So thank you. What I thought I'd do is quickly provide context to who we are at Park Mobile. Uh, hopefully some of the folks uh, not from the Park Mobile side who are on this call today have uh, experience using our products and services, or if not, you will in the future. But let me introduce who we are and how we've grown as a business and how we operate. And, and what I'll be able to do is get into uh, some of the challenges with the success we've had and the way in which we operate uh, that really kind of dovetail into why we had to partner and choose certain solutions to help us solve these problems. So first and foremost, uh, just to highlight Park Mobile for everybody, our mission here as a company is really to power smart mobility for every driver and every vehicle. And we could have a whole discussion about driving today and autonomous in the future, but we're positioning ourselves to really be creative and innovative and really connect parking with the mobility ecosystem, which I think you're going to find is uh, fascinating, but also uh, significantly fragmented, more than I think anybody would understand from an outside perspective. And the whole reason we do it is we, we strongly believe we can really eliminate friction in what, uh, the way in which the world works today, and we can make it much more convenient for uh, not just our consumers who are attempting to park, but the clients and the operators who provide parking inventory to consumers. So let me highlight just a little bit about the business. We have the largest network, industry leading capabilities when it comes to a number of products and services. We have 
reference here to where all of our products and services are deployed across the United States. Some of the things that we do I'd like to highlight uh, that might resonate with you guys when we talk about parking and mobility. First of all, you know, think about driving up to the curb and parking on street or pulling into a garage, whether the garage has a gate or no gate. And the historic way of having to pay for your time parking there has been done by kiosks or meters until Park Mobile introduced the way to really deal with that through mobile payments. We make it a lot easier for consumers to not only pay for parking through any of the, their desired payment methods, but we also allow consumers to extend their parking remotely without having to return to those physical meters. And that's really how we got our start. The other piece I'd mention is you've really seen us transition in terms of products and services from on-demand parking into the business of reservation parking. So there's two good use cases. Perhaps you're driving downtown, uh, you're a little bit later than normal, but your favorite lot closest to your work is where you would like to park. You can reserve a spot in that lot with Park Mobile, and we'll make sure that that spot is held for you upon arrival. The other good use case for reservations is event parking. We do, and I'll show some stats on this, we do a lot of work with event venues, whether you're talking about Taylor Swift or Elton John concerts to uh, major sports teams, both at a professional and an amateur level. And we'll highlight a few of those uh, in the presentation. So that's a little bit about Park Mobile. I want to hit you guys up with some of the stats that quite frankly, we're, you know, we're extremely proud of, but it's these stats that start to lead into the story about the challenges you can imagine we have as an engineering organization keeping up with this kind of growth. So we have 17 million users nationwide. Most apps don't pierce a million, certainly get close to 10 million. We're at 17 million users nationwide and it's exponential in terms of that growth. In fact, 18 months ago, when I joined the company, it was two weeks into my tenure that I attended the 10 millionth user celebration with the organization. And in 18 months, we've acquired an additional 7 million users. We're at 9 million monthly transactions. And even though we're understood and known for a mobile app, we actually are a B2B 2C model in terms of a sales um, operation. So what that means is we're actually partnering, we're doing business with the cities and the municipalities for which we have 41 of the top 100 cities, or we're partnering up with airports or universities or event venues. And it's those clients on our B2B side that deploy our B2C capabilities, our mobile app and our web products to allow people to purchase parking on demand or uh, through reservations. Ranked number three in the navigation category behind Waze and Google Maps. That's certainly uh, something we're proud of. Uh, and that's very, very hard to do. We're in great company. From a statistics perspective, one in every 15 US drivers have Park Mobile deployed. We've seen 173% increase in new clients. Those B2B folks, whether it's cities or operators, et cetera, have joined us in over the last five years, which has helped us add over 5 million new, new users. Uh, in the last 12 months, I mentioned the seven over the last 18. And we actually did 20 million more transactions in 19 versus 2018. And so you start to see these scale numbers and you start to see uh, the tax that this probably has on an engineering organization to keep our infrastructures and our applications in tip top shape that we can grow along these exponential curve lines. A lot of people understand Park Mobile for the consumer app, and that's natural. We would expect that. It's you know, very centric to our brand, but Park Mobile is actually a platform company. And so I'll introduce you know, why that is. You know, we do have a best-in-class uh, industry-leading product on both mobile and web, for which our consumers integrate with, Park Mobile I.O., but we also have PM360, which is our platform that our clients use, whether it's an operator or a city. I talked about our business model. We actually partner, whether it's airports, universities, or the cities themselves, they're actually using PM360 as a platform 
to have effect on either rates, policies, or to see their reporting, whether it's analytics or financials around what is going on in the consumer experience. And then given the fact that our ecosystem is, is tremendous, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, we have a developer portal, which gives our partners access to our APIs so that they can uh, interact with us and we can continue to extend our network reach. So that's Park Mobile as a platform and some statistics. Let me transition a little bit into the challenge that comes along with that. And I just kind of mentioned the developer portal. We actually are integrated to over a hundred different partners in this ecosystem. It's, it is actually very fragmented and there's not a one size fits all, or there's not one partner that specializes uh, in the whole thing. You know, you have different pockets, whether it's uh, those enforcing uh, parking on the streets or whether it's those that are uh, in control of who gets in and out of garages. You've got EV charging and meters. We're connected with over 13 different payment processors in the United States. There's folks that tell us predictively whether or not there's parking available in certain parts of town we call availability. And we're integrated with a lot of other folks just to bring in data so that as a platform, we can be the one place to show our clients Regardless of how many channels you actually enable in a garage or a city, everything you need to know about your performance across those channels. And as a, as a CTO and as an engineering organization, obviously restful services across hundred plus integrations uh, that are, continue to grow exponentially and we're adding more and more every single day really requires us to position ourselves uh, with an engineering vision that will be secure safe, reliable, um, but also scale with the growth of this business. And so when I got here about 18 months ago, we'll start to bring the story back to our topic today. Chris, that team, uh, my leadership organization, we sat down and we said, given the context of Park Mobile, where we're going, the success we're having as an organization, what do we want to look like in our future state? And this isn't this isn't necessarily anything new. It's about decomposing monolithic applications into uh, more fine-grained services, gives us speed, the ability to isolate certain things, invest more in scale on certain services. We want to be channel agnostic. We're an API first company and we have a lot of folks, as I showed you, coming in through APIs. So how do we do that in a quick, rapid and secure way? We also have to enable our own mobile and third party mobile and web channels. So we've, we've decided, you know, in a multi data center situation 18 months ago, part cloud, part private third party managed data center, how do we strive long term for a cloud infrastructure, cloud native applications that position us to take advantage of scale, elasticity, things of that nature? How do we start to break down those monoliths into somewhat microservices, but in some cases, larger domains, but certainly smaller in nature? How do we take advantage of design principles that really take into account what things you need to concern yourselves with in the cloud, as well as take advantage of things like automatic elasticity? And given the, the performance of this business, we have to be able to scale. We have to provide somebody instant response and we have to be prepared to do that, even though we're acquiring new integrations and new transactions every day. So given those challenges, we decide as an organization, we need to move forward. We need to find strategic partners who can work with us to solve some of these problems. And we really started on the topic of an API gateway. That's really where it started. It started uh, in the category of how do we bring together these, this different data center architecture behind a north-south gateway, secure our APIs, and set us up for success long-term. And as our research into our options and partners, we started to really extend our thought process about that's where we want to start, but it's about enabling developers to be autonomous. It's about uh, better security. Uh, it's about long-term east-west traffic management as we get into the concepts of service mesh. And that's really how we started to evolve into the problem. And I'm going to bring it up here in a second. 
I'll just touch on this last point. Now I'm going to let the team really talk about the technical challenges with our vision and what they've been chartered to solve. The one thing I did ask, and this is based on my experience, I said, look, this is we're to partner with people who are excellent in what they do. I wanted to make sure that we could then focus on what we do well, which is developing our products and services in this mobility ecosystem. And we sort of set out with five sort of key values. And I think, uh, and I'm happy to be here today talking about how these five values map to our partnership with Solo IO. I wanted something that is very, very flexible that can evolve with our architecture. And I know that becomes common sense, but the truth is everybody has a starting point and everybody has the North Star in terms of their ending spot. The reality is we spend most of our career and tenure getting from point A to point B. So what we needed was an architecture that could help us along that journey as opposed to only really satisfy our requirements at the end of the road. And there's a big difference there. So we wanted flexibility to evolve and work with the things that we have. We wanted something modern in terms of both innovative and proven. We wanted a company that's pushing boundaries, but built on top of things that are proven for which there's a community that surrounds uh, just like Envoy. We wanted something that could scale with our growth. You've seen our statistics. And we wanted something from a value perspective that didn't require us to outlay a lot of cash up front and could really start to show its benefits ahead of necessarily the expense. And the partnership piece is critical. I want to be able to reach out. I want my engineers to be able to reach out to somebody and be able to have a conversation about a roadblock almost immediately and, and help us get to where we want to go. And then we found those things uh, in partnering with Solo IO. And so that was some of the business tenants that we focused on. And Chris, why don't you and the team, Anthony, you guys can grab the slide share. Why don't you guys do that? And then if you all would kind of walk through some of the technical challenges with Matt's vision that you all were chartered to solve and give the audience a feel for those things, that would be great. All right. Thanks, Matt. We'll do. I'm waiting for the slide to pop up real quick. Did I share? Sure. I did. Oh, there, oh, there, go. there it goes. It's a little delayed. <laughs> there we go. So, all right. So, to Matt's point, so we did come across some challenges, and uh, believe we were talk uh, Matt was touching upon this early on. We did experience some really, really fast growth in 2019. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do from an engineering perspective is essentially not slow not only the SRE team down, but the rest of the development teams. Um, and really empower them. So, the and this is touching on bullet one. Um, I, we are firm believers of DevOps as more of a concept and engineering practice and not a team solution. So we like the idea of you build it, you own it, you own it from soup to nuts. And when you get it from your uh, project inception, you take it all the way to prod and it's all through a push of a button through our kind of CI CD process. So, um, I'm big believers in empowering the teams, and that's what kind of allowed us to essentially move quick, move fast. And where we saw Glue come in is it actually allowed the SRE team to essentially just take over the kind of more the, not the administration side of it, but kind of just the configuration aspect of it and kind of disseminate that out to the teams and kind of through Helm charts and things of that nature. Um, and yes, it did require to get some of the dev teams up on that, but it was actually quite simple, essentially work on, on things like Helm and the way we do have our pipeline set up and our microservices architectures that we're moving towards, um, a Glue really enabled us to essentially move quick um, and establish that with our engineering team and kind of just not have the uh, SRE team kind of be that bottleneck. So we all kind of move in concert together. So SRE team coupled with the dev teams and we're constantly pushing forward. So there, there is no bottleneck. So we do like the whole concept of empowering devs you build it, you own it. It's a fantastic model. If uh, And that's kind of the vision I had for the team. And here in engineering, I just wanted the guys to push forward and just not slow us down. So 
Um, so that's the big one on bullet one. Uh, when we moved to cost drivers and talking to Matt about this, um, we did survey the landscape and, uh, you know, there are players out there um, that we're all very familiar with, but the fact that glue was essentially upcoming and they were definitely willing to partner up with us and actually just work with us through some of the challenges that we kind of uh, encountered in 2019 was uh, something that really, really uh, attracted us to kind of just make that decision, just go with glue and the solo uh, team. Um, uh, so uh, we, we like that from a perspective, uh, from kind of, uh, you know, like the cost perspective and the amount of volume that we can essentially drive um, with our user base. Like Matt was saying, I think we're up to 2.4 or 2 million uh, users a month. So we needed something that kind of would scale with us, but, you know, uh, w wouldn't hurt us in the pockets essentially. So, right. uh, it and also on top of that is the not not just talking dollars, but right. t time that it takes to pick up something new and mm -hmm. and run with it. Because time time also equals money. So instead of wasting our time trying to figure out the solution and how we plan on mapping out the new APIs of what paths where routes they go to, Glue pretty much came in and, and did a lot did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And going back to point one, everything being configurable within their pipelines was, was just a great, great added benefit with partnering up with Blue. Right, no, totally here, Rebecca, thanks. Um, so just moving on, so, uh, so we were established, like Matt was saying, so we're moving on on our API gateway strategy um, seeing essentially what our landscape here internally look like um, and actually kind of just making sense of uh, essentially just north south traffic, you know, traffic coming into the network and then traffic within the network. Um, we, we really had to just kind of see what made sense and we liked not only marrying up the old world and what I mean the old world, uh, you know, not cloud native but uh, but also marrying up some cloud native stuff that we were doing i mean we are on aws but we weren't really cloud native we were just on aws so moving the teams along and just making everybody aware like hey you know what we really want to push towards that cloud native vision um getting uh glue in place to handle not only api traffic but essentially kind of just front some of the issues we do have because we do have monoliths so we we are still dealing with decomposing our existing monoliths as well as marrying up our new microservices architectures so uh, we needed something that would play nice in both worlds and and glue absolutely did that and it's fantastic it's almost seamless um and uh moving towards that whole new vision i mean we are trying to be as uh, Kubernetes native as possible. So we also need things to play nice in the cluster. Um, and Glue definitely does that. Uh, so we, we did that that's checking off all our marks or our little check boxes. I'm like, hey, Glue is just hitting everything. And it, it also marries up the old world. So we were definitely happy on that front. Um, security wise, you know, we got all the access controls that we're looking for. Essentially, that's kind of big on our side, especially um, Arbok. Um, and anything like that. We do want to empower our devs, but we we want to be invasive when we tackle security. We don't want to kind of just strong arm security. So we kind of want to make it seamless. Uh, so that was also nice coming out of glue. Um, and I guess empowered us, I guess, with all the. Yeah, it let, it, it let us be good at what we're actually good at and exactly. not have to worry about it. it the, the, for the developers to shoot themselves in the foot. So right. it, there's a lot of safeguards in place where we can lock them, lock them into certain namespaces. And in that namespace, they, they're managing their own routes, their own endpoints, as, along with their applications. Right. So that's fantastic. Again, going back to the you build it, you own it model and hold true DevOps as an engineering practice and not as a just a one team practice. So very nice. And, and on point six, uh, we do have varying stacks. It'd be nice to say that, hey, you know what? We've kind of just settled on Go and that's, that's, that's our language. We're, we're using things like Dynamo or Mongo or things like that. But the, the, the truth of the matter is it's, we're very polyglot um, uh, environment. Um, so we did have to just kind of just also look into that and make sure that we can actually hook in nicely to everything that we're doing for, uh, for the other teams that are also on 
different tech stacks. So uh, this slide kind of shows us where we are um, and also a little bit on where we're kind of moving towards. So you can see from left to right, uh, mobile native, Kotlin, Swift, moving on to the website, it's React, Node, moving things up next. On the API front, it's open API spec, YAML, um, JavaScript, and primarily our backend services. Uh, we do have primarily Ruby and .NET. Um, we are shifting a little more towards uh, building up microservices around Go. Um, we are uh, heavy fanatics of Go, as maybe you can see on our desk. Uh, I love it. Um, personally speaking, it takes me back to my college days when I first discovered C, and I kind of just fell in love, so it feels like I'm back in college, just coding in C. Um, uh, but we are using things like .NET Core, which is fantastic, uh, which is just as fast and just as powerful. But again, we do have a varying stack. So we, had, we needed something to play nice across the field, across everything that we currently have. Um, and again, like I said, Glue just, just, it just checked off those, those, those check boxes. Um, behind the scenes that you can see, again, it's, it's not all, but everything cloud native. We do have Kubernetes, we're running Lambdas, we got EC2s. Um, but again, it's, it's marrying that old world with the new and allowing us to kind of just seamlessly transition from the old to the new with, uh, without impacting the business at the end of the day. So a lot of this stuff just gets obfuscated from the business and it's kind of just business as usual. So it's, it's, it's fantastic from an API perspective, from a platform perspective, Glue is, is it's just, it's just hitting all those marks. <laughs> so, um, so that is our stack in a nutshell. So I'm just going to kick it off to Raphael and Anthony to talk more a little bit about implementations and how we've done it, a little more in the weeds, so to speak. So, Raphael? All right. So the, uh, the search of an API gateway for, for all our uh, APIs was a very huge challenge for us, mainly because we were, we, once we got everything up and running in Kubernetes, everything was being deployed, the team is leveled up and learned the, how, to, how to use a Kubernetes cluster, then, then comes in where what the existing API solutions that already exist. So meaning last year, it, we, we mainly saw EKS, AKS, GKE started taking, taking up the market and all the current uh, API solutions that were available were mainly more focused towards older solutions. So they were all very outdated or they were trying to work with Kubernetes and they weren't working very well. Some of them. Uh, For some, yeah, like, so a couple of the competitors that we looked at uh, were not, didn't allow us to install anything inside our own network or in our AWS infrastructure. So uh, we would have to install uh, their proprietary programs inside our cluster to be able to reach out and communicate with these external APIs, which uh, was kind of problematic because as we were talking about earlier, uh, we, there's, they had uh, a lot of built-in packages that had some outdated, uh, you know, versions of Nginx that we didn't feel comfortable running in our environment. Um, also, a lot of these uh, solutions that we had looked at required uh, a very large um, learning curve get to get up to speed to actually use that product and um, that that's that stems back from uh, these other solutions trying to make pretty much fit a square inside of a circle mm -hmm. where and we think kind of turned into a black box and it, it 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 just wasn't wasn't feasible with what we were looking for and on top of that since these solutions were already had name recognition getting in contact with them and speaking to our, our current uh, issues with the product and trying to make it work kind of was falling on deaf, deaf ears. So we kind of... If we, if we needed to change it, we would have to figure out a workaround. Right. There's no it's, one to really work with on trying to get a solution in place that would actually help us move forward quicker with their solution. Right. So, uh, so it, felt, it felt more like, a, like creating a hack around a system that should just, be, just work seamlessly with our current, current uh, stack. And uh, and obviously, when when you have these types of types of types of issues, you you kind of be, silo your silo yourself from the rest of the team. So now only now you have to have a dedicated team managing these other solutions, which 
at the end of the day, really nobody wants. That team becomes a bottleneck. Uh, it wastes time and money, and uh, that's just something that we, we couldn't afford, especially with all the growth that, that we plan on doing in the, in the coming years. Yeah, All right, we have to move fast. We have to move fast. That's, that's the so, bottom line. So that, that kind of ties into other solutions not being flexible with, with our needs. And uh, I think that kind of we can segue there into like the security issues. So being that glue runs inside Kubernetes, we're able to use some of the existing RBAC that we already uh, set up with developers deploying their applications inside the cluster already. So Glue allowed us to restrict developers to certain namespaces. They can add parts to the API uh, without having to have us uh, delegate permissions out in like some external product. So like not giving them access to like other dashboards and right. stuff like that. Right. This solution allowed us to use our existing permission structure. The developers can deploy the APIs as needed into their namespaces and then Glue pulls everything in uh, automatically. So, say, so, uh, yeah. So, reasons why we chose Glue here at Park Mobile. Uh, pretty much, it was easy. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. what, what, what I mean by that is, as most of you know, Kubernetes is not easy. But one of the things, is, one of the things that Glue does very well is it was built literally on top of the Kubernetes API. So once you've already, once you're actually gone to this step and trying to implement, implement Glue, you've already done the hard work on figuring out Kubernetes already. And then Glue acts like an extension of Kubernetes. It's like, a, it's, a, it's just, everything's a CRD. Everything is, is native, native to Kubernetes, which, it, which makes it so easy to, to manage and actually delegate uh, the management of of these endpoints to the development teams because we grant them our back rights to just their namespace where they only where they should have access to so they won't stomp on anybody else's production uh, uh, workloads or any of that. Just uh, just touching back on the easy part. I mean, uh, Lou came with a really nice co uh, command line that allowed us to basically have an API gateway up within a few hours of discovering the product which is amazing. So, and then like, as Raphael was saying, you know, we've already had people going through the learning curve of learning how Kubernetes works. Once you know how Kubernetes works, you pretty much know how Glue works. Yeah. This Glue's just building on top of that. Some of the other solutions we worked with was a learn, a even higher learning curve where now that you've learned Kubernetes, now you need to learn this other external platform that ties into it. So Glue really kept everything streamlined, you know, we can include all the configurations for Glue in the same Helm charts as the actual app code and everything like that. Yeah, exactly. So, so that, that those those were big, big uh, reasons why we ended up going with Glue, and uh, just the uh, the the Slack room that was very helpful. The community is very helpful when any type of situation or solution that we might need or want, their 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 engineers react almost immediately. So there, there's that, and uh, it's, it's just been great overall experience since we first contacted. So one of the other benefits we really liked out of Glue was that it's actually installed inside of our Kubernetes cluster, which is on our internal network. So uh, one of their main uh, points is that you, you can use Glue to mesh together many different backends. So we do have apps running in Kubernetes that Glue basically connects to like seamlessly but we also have monolithic uh, infrastructure as well on still some uh, on-premise data centers but uh, since glue actually runs inside of our network we could actually set upstreams to uh, those monolithic servers you know through aws's direct connect uh, without having to go through another route so we as a, from a security standpoint we have all of our network going through our internal links we don't have to worry about any uh, risk from exposing um, external endpoints. We can keep everything inside, and uh, Glue just really helps with that because it, it's actually on the network that can talk to all these endpoints. Right. So let's say we want to refat pull out the mo uh, one piece of the monolith, and that piece of the monolith is a particular path or route. We will just create a new a new a new uh, route 
that instead of that pretty much forks off of the monolith and just goes to the new microservice that we stood up. Not not having to touch any like the monolith or to redeploy anything new. We just tell glue, hey, uh, instead of going to for this particular API, go here instead. And right. it's we, just as easy as that. Preserving the same paths on our API, but in the back end, we're just switching where that path is being routed. Exactly. Right. So I want to touch on the last point on this slide before we move on. It's, it's infrastructure as code. So just so everybody on, on, on the channel, on Zoom can and understand, like we are heavy on the coding aspect of the infrastructure. So the majority, if not all the infrastructure is in code. Um, which helps us um, in terms of speed and deployment and uh, as well as embedding that infrastructure code in pipelines. So not only are dev teams on pipelines, so is this team right here, the SRE team, um, putting things in code and easily deploying out um, and running tests. And I think in the text slide uh, that you all just saw, there is Terraform. So we are on Terraform. Um, and this kind of helps it really nice to just pave the infrastructure as we go and hook into the Glue CTL and do things of that nature to easily pave the different environments that we have going on. Um, we are big proponents of the whole uh, cattle, uh, or actually not pets, uh, but cattle, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Trading so, our infrastructure yeah. cattle, not so pets. So we, we, yeah. we don't care. And the fact that we're a little more containerized nowadays just helps us really not care about our servers. I, I love that. So, uh, and that's kind of the model that we're moving towards. That is the whole cloud nativity that we're kind of just pushing along and, and moving towards. Um, and with things like this, it's like on this slide, you see the GitOps. So just better GitOps, running things from Git, having the teams be empowered to kind of deploy out their API endpoints as needed, no intervention from the SRE team. It's just go. Right, because the, the way that Glue works is each namespace has has their own route tables and we pretty much the way glue works is everything is a crd it's just as, as long as glue is able to get into your namespace and look at look at this route table it'll bring it in merge it in all for once uh, and centralize the whole the whole configuration right like mo most other solutions what they do is there's one configuration file and only you can't allow the whole company access to this file because you're going to break something and in in, in in there there's just no no way around that. So every everyone being completely separated, and then glue having uh, webhooks whenever some whenever there is a change to a route, telling developers hey that like, there's uh, there's syntax errors here we can't accept this really prevents critical outages that everyone remembers the S3 outage <laughs> several years ago where it was an oops moment. So we're trying to minimize those types of outages, and and Glue does it does it beautifully uh, with with Kubernetes. So yeah, since the Glue configuration files are just additional YAML that's the same as your Kubernetes deployment files, it's just another part of that configuration. Yep. You don't right. have to learn, you don't have to do anything in XML or JSON. It's just the same files, different uh, API and Kubernetes, but it all looks the same. Easier to work with. Yeah, it also it much. also allows us to parameterize the actual configuration based off environment. So the way we deploy these out is through Helm, and each each uh, environment just has a new set of values that get pushed up with with each environment. So right, that, so that's where a lot of our time was spent. We've developed uh, parameterized Helm charts that we can hand off to the developers and basically just fill in the blanks. And that's it. And out, every, yeah. everyone is everyone has the same template, and they all they do is fill in the blanks, and everyone just go 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 go. Right. So, so now that the dev teams are empowered, it kind of helps out. You should, that knowledge is now democratized across the org, so dev teams can just ask each other questions. They don't have to come to the SRE team. So it's 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 empowering the entire engineering team. Is yes, the and, idea. and bridging the gaps between develop the other developers and kind of bringing down the silos. And yeah, exactly. Being more. Uh, Collaborative. So that that that's very that was very important to us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, next slide. Well, scale. Yeah. So I guess one of the biggest yeah. things now that we are trying to move all of our APIs behind Glue, uh, there's a lot of traffic. I mean, as Matt mentioned earlier, we have 17 <laughs> plus million users, and they're all hitting these same APIs. We needed to have an API gateway that would be able to handle that traffic without batting an eye. 
Uh, so I, so in the back end, Glue is running Envoy proxies. Uh, they are just fast. You know, we can't really say anything That's else. That's the bottom line. They're Envoy is really fast. fast. Uh, and you can see on the slide here, what we're actually giving the, it's not really a matter of the uh, servers that we're running it on, but how much of the resources we're actually assigning to these Envoy proxies. And you can see there, we're about a tenth of a core and 400 megabytes of memory is enough to handle most of the traffic that we're getting right now over seven proxies. Yeah. The nice thing is that, you know, same thing, native Kubernetes integration, we can do pod auto scaling. So if we do go over that threshold, we can spin up more or less proxies just as we need as the traffic goes up and down every day. And um, we touched early on this on security, but again, it's the native Kubernetes RBAC tooling available to us where we just lock every, every team has service accounts and the deployment, there's a uh, service accounts for their CI/CD pro uh, processes. So every everyone is assigned, or every responsible team for their every team is responsible for their own app in their own namespaces. So mm -hmm. that's how we pretty much divide up uh, roles and responsibilities depending on if you're if you're a, a, a contributor to a certain app, you have access to that namespace, and and that's how that's how we pretty much make sure. Yeah, so like us and the SRE team, we can manage like the base virtual service that contains all of the uh, configurations, like whether we want to set certain security headers or set global timeouts on requests and everything like that. The developers don't really have to think about any of that stuff because all they're doing are creating uh, more routes, more routes, and then applying them in their own namespaces that inherit all the value that we have in our base virtual services. <laughs> yes, I think we're good on that. Yeah, there we go. Where are we now? Well, now we're, we're actually yeah, running seven Envoy proxies now in production. We have uh, several several teams. Several teams now uh, are are in. We have one team that's in has uh, applications in beta. Uh, our in most of our internal traffic is actually being run by Glue internal services. So, so we're, we have already started making sure the apps are talking to each other internally via Glue. And uh, we're just gonna keep, like our lessons learned were, well, it's hard, it's hard to find a solution that, that fits everyone's needs, um, but the way that Blue integrates with Kubernetes was, I mean, we can't you we can't we can't force a solution to work with Kubernetes, and a solution can't just, you know, kind of step their foot in on on one particular feature of Kubernetes and then just abandon it. It's, it's right. it has to be all or nothing with Kubernetes, and that that was one of the things we struggled with with uh, trying to do other solutions was just trying to make it work coming up with the hack coming up with the workaround because i mean th those were the those were the 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 needs of the at the time so yeah and i would say that you know the goal here as an organization is to be uh completely containerized we want all of our applications running in containers running kubernetes so it just makes sense that the solution we would pick to handle our API gateway also runs in Kubernetes. So we want to treat that as our like main platform. Uh, once the learning curve with Kubernetes is passed over, then everything just kind of fits into place. Right, and everything being automated and, and testable was also very important because at the end of the day, we don't want to be a bottleneck to the developers. We don't want to stifle innovation. We want everyone to be empowered to to from from inception from the, from idea all the way to production, a developer sh should be able to create any new endpoint, any new application, any new API without the need of going through a million teams yeah. just to <laughs> just to get something rolling. So we've we pretty much put everything in place so that the, the developers can just can just code, do do whatever it is that they're do good what they at. Do fast, yeah. do, exactly. Create, innovate. Yeah, I would just pick up on there as well. Um, 
So when we tried using some of the cloud native uh, API solutions and while it made sense at the beginning, you know, a lot of people were familiar with AWS and the resources to create in there. Uh, we were having a harder time with the security there because the, you need access to the API to be able to manage AWS resources. Uh, we were having a hard time with the separation of concerns with the developers not having to create the entire thing from the bottom. And uh, so us being able to provision some of the, uh, basically lay some of the groundwork down ahead of time and then handing off these templatized uh, uh, configuration files to the developers really kind of helps things move along more seamlessly. Um, right. So, yeah. so the biggest security concern, and, and think as part of your evolutionary process, especially in engineering, you, you will, I'm not going to say all the time, but a good chunk of the time, you will outgrow some of the cloud native solutions or cloud provided services, I should say. Yeah, they're great for getting started. Yeah, you, you end up growing, and I'm not knocking anything you get cloud uh, cloud native either from something like Azure or GCP or AWS, but they just, they can't be everything to everyone, unfortunately. And when you try to get stuff like RBOC or a little more security and not give, uh, you know, your dev teams full God rights essentially to your infrastructure. Yeah, you lose flexibility. You lose a lot of flexibility. So we needed something that would kind of just rein that in a little bit. So, and again, the glue just check that off. So. Yeah, so it helps us if we ever did decide to go multi-cloud, if we want to end up exactly. in that way, we don't have to, we're not locked into a particular cloud provider. Yeah, it's yeah, Kubernetes, yeah. which can be installed in any cloud. And glue can be installed in Kubernetes. We're so this leads us into our what's next for Park Mobile, and the one of the actually we haven't even talked about this, but it, Glue can actually manage your service mesh, so everyone understands how difficult and even uh, and how hard Istio is to to learn, install, get it get working. Glue actually will manage that for you. Will manage it for <laughs> you. It was actually built for that because they understood that there are other services inside a cluster and especially when a cluster gets huge there's so many services and you're going to need you're going to need some uh, service mess to manage all of this glue thought of that and integrated that with their systems mm -hmm. so just so you don't have to worry about it and uh, the next thing that they actually do very well is their ser serverless they they integrated k native to one of their their first integrate. They made sure that Knative works seamlessly, so you you don't have to be locked in with Lambdas. You can control how your your serverless backend in in Kubernetes on top of Glue. So yeah, so your function as a service, you can actually bring it in house into Kubernetes, and you don't have to have Azure functions or Lambdas. You know. Yes. And the nice thing about and we're since we're kind of in the middle, we do run Lambdas, we do run some like serverless Knative stuff, but Glue can. It, can connect to both of those. So right. there are plugins right. in Glue to invoke Lambda functions based on API requests. But at the same, but if we did switch to running like Knative serverless function, it's seamless. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's transparent to the end user. They would never see the change. We can go back and forth. You know, it, it's a, a great uh, product right now for kind of bridging the gap between these two I ideas. Right, and obviously always continuing to break down our monoliths. And uh, I mean, that's right now we have a handful of them that we're trying to break up. Yeah. We've, we've actually already moved functionality away from the monolith. So, and it's, it's just been, a blue, blue has been great with that. Yeah. And uh, the ability just to be multi, multi cluster and multi region, uh, since Istio actually does support multi, multi cloud installations and glue is built on top of that. It makes it all, all very easy and simple, especially with the uh, the service mesh hub, that uh, I don't know was recently released, I think, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that 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 is has been amazing. So we're hoping to start leveraging that sometime this year. Yeah. And uh, that's it from us. Thank yeah. you guys for listening. Yep. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, there are a few questions that have come in, so I want to just, um, I'll read them off to y'all, um, and then we can leave that um, slide up um, with some good links for people to get started and learn more about um, both Solo and Park Mobile.
So uh, first question here is to Matt. Um, APIs uh, appear to be important for Park Mobile. Have you considered um, you know, things like GraphQL? Uh, actually, yes, we have. Uh, in fact, we've done some proof of concepts with it. Uh, look, I'm just going to share my philosophy. Um, not everything that is brand new is good for the organization necessarily. I, I just have an opinion. GraphQL solves a certain problem statement. And you have to make sure you actually have that problem statement for which you're willing to make the investment really with the people to understand how to you know, work with GraphQL before you make that leap. And in our case, I would also tell you, we're the most advanced in our industry. Um, I, I firmly believe based on my interactions and you have to, you think about that ecosystem of a hundred plus folks, you know, there's still soap services out there, mainly rest yes. taking, <laughs> GraphQL. taking that leap to GraphQL for our business we don't want to get too far ahead of practicality. So that's, that's um, a CTO's answer to, you know, choose what we invest in and what we don't. You I, can add, yeah. oh, um, I can add one point to that, Matt. Uh, we have actually explored, there is a side product of Glue called Scoop, which is actually uh, allows you to natively integrate GraphQL endpoints inside Glue. Uh, we, Started off using um, AWS AppSync, but we have been looking into switching out to use uh, Glue's version as well. Uh, we this hasn't been on the top of the priority list right now, but it has definitely been something we've looked at. I think it's an interesting point that you bring up that it's a there's always going to be new technology, and it's important to just. Um, as a technology team to be aware um, to learn it and understand it, but it's. Uh, you don't always go from like the, the new widget first, you actually go from your use case first. And then um, your use case and the ecosystem you serve. And then there's that place where those meet in the middle. Um, there is a, another question here on, um, are you utilizing um, um, any microservices with gRPC in the Google environment today? That's a good point. I think we are. So we are leveraging. We're starting one of the teams, I think actually two of the teams. I don't think we've married them up yet, but they will hopefully sometime this year. But we are establishing gRPC endpoints. Um, I don't know if we performance tested those yet. Um, we've performance tested the other ones, the RESTful ones, but the gRPC ones are available for consumption internally for our teams. And we're looking to leverage that yeah, against Glue, but also from microservice to microservice and the whole service mesh. So we're hopefully working towards that for internal communications this year. Yeah, one of the things that Glue, that Glue does is pretty cool. Uh, if you are running uh, an app inside the cluster that is exposing a gRPC service, Glue actually sees that when it when it's Yeah, it, it's auto discovery. It auto discovers that service, and all we have to do in RN is expose that gRPC endpoint through the proxy, and then it will it is accessible via Glue. So they have thought of that part. Cool. Um, I guess that's one of the plus sides of like giving you know giving that right amount of like, you know, developer freedom and access, they're doing stuff and you may not exactly know <laughs> what all they've set up <laughs> uh, right. while they're going. That's, that's, that's the good part about that. Um, another question here is, do you use Terraform by itself or do you also combine it with other tools like a chef? Uh, well, we haven't really had that much of a use case for Chef, really. With Kubernetes, since everything is already provisioned with configuration files, it's kind of it manages itself that way. Well, we have used Terraform uh, to invoke local provisioners when, so after the infrastructure comes up, it can actually uh, go underneath and create a lot of the inside stuff. So like we actually use Terraform to uh, provision the entire uh, EKS cluster. And we've been working on it for a while now to help us with upgrades and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, and just to add a little more color to that, uh, it's in the containerized world, it's just a lot easier to use things like Terraform. You don't need to worry about servers anymore where things like Chef or Ansible or Puppet come into play or the whole soft stack. Um, it, it's, it's quite nice. That's something that we, I think as part of our journey, we started looking into that because we weren't really cloud native mm -hmm. to begin with. And we did have a lot of just old school concepts and, and kind of your typical on-prem environment. So we were like, hey, all right, you know what? Let's, let's look at Ansible. 
well, let's look at Chef. Let's see what we can accomplish with on prem. But then we look like we, we keep saying we move so fast here that I think we we did like a quick discovery. Or like, yeah, Ansible looks good, oh, and then we started we, shifting containers. We yeah. So that all all the Chef Ansible puppet that got kind of replaced with everyone just having a Docker file and that's, building that's off it. of building <laughs> off of Alpine uh, an image that literally just has a kernel. That that that's it. And uh, just install whatever our dependencies we need, uh, the application needs. So, having to manage individual servers, other than the the, the EC2s that house the monolith, yeah, uh, we don't, we really just use Terraform to stay up the infrastructure, and then the the developers just uh, the way they interact with the Kubernetes clusters through Helm. Yeah. So, it's almost very much a, a kind of a plug-in architecture, a plug-in pattern. Uh, essentially for everything. So it's, it's all the hooks that are provided along the way in the pipeline that developers hook into, and it just allows them to do the work. Again, this team no longer is the bottleneck. It's like the developers have all the power uh, within Rails, certain you know certain Rails, but it, it, they have all the power to do things. So it's, it's that's why we love yeah, it. Like you said, move faster, right? Um, put it within the right uh, guardrails of how you want things configured and set up and secured, and then let people run and build the things they need to build, right? Exactly. Right. Um, I have, uh, personally, um, as a solo employee here, I have a question for you um, to elaborate a little bit on your, um, the, when you were talking about your scale testing um, and the environment, you meant you had a, a comment in there about how much um, resource the Envoy proxies were using. Um, and um, the, the other bit was um, the latency that having the glue, the milliseconds um, that glue added, how much compute and memory is the, are the glue components using um, on your existing uh, Kubernetes nodes? Because it's right, it, you installed it on top. So is it kind of a lot of overhead there from a compute usage? No, no, it's very, 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 very small. It's, it's, using, it's using one tenth of a, one -tenth of an, of a core and it, it topped out at 400 megs of memory. So, okay. so good, good. Very little overhead, very, very little overhead. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. And we've been able to see these metrics because Glue comes with a uh, built-in Prometheus server and Grafana endpoint, so we can actually see these requests coming in and have a lot That's of true. observability into that. But we can see on the servers that when, when we were doing these load testings with like 100,000 requests, it, they barely they barely moved right and we're doing this in a in a production environment so while we were hammering our api that same api was also being used in production with, okay. with no, no effect yeah well, and that's 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 how high our confidence was that with 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 envoy being the back end uh, and with glue just just handle being able to handle all the traffic we can possibly throw at it so Right, and just, I guess it's more for, for more uh, quantitative, I mean, we have how many proxies? We're running seven proxies? Seven, seven proxies. Seven proxies. proxies. Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then, oh, go ahead. They're testing in production again, Betty. I know, <laughs> I know. There's a, there's a whole, like, it's, that's really... Uh, we weren't we're supposed to say that. Also <laughs> deploy on Fridays. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one... Um, I want to say, like, uh, you talked a lot about security and kind of role-based access control. You're using, um, you're using kind of the native Kube RBAC, um, and then you're namespacing the developers. Did you have another? Um, was there an integration also with kind of the, like your own identity management system? And um, if so, what do you use? So we're we're using um, as far as access to the AWS environment. We're using AWS's SSO product, uh, which connects via LDAP to our uh, AD on, okay. in the office, and we're actually able to map because we're using EKS, which is you know Amazon native. We're actually able to map these AWS roles to accounts inside Kubernetes. So okay. to authenticate to talk to our Kubernetes cluster, you actually have to authenticate via our AD mm -hmm. service, service right. and uh, pass through the role that you've assumed to be able to talk to the Kubernetes cluster. Cool. Um, that is it, and we are actually um, at the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank um, you all, um, the whole Park Mobile team, um, for presenting and answering the questions. Um, and they're also very active in Slack. So if there's folks on the webinar here, um, if you have questions, you see our uh, link to slack.solo.io. You can find them in Slack and also ask some more direct questions, maybe ones that you know weren't you weren't um, you didn't post here as you noodle on this information. 
Um, this is recorded and I'll have it posted online by the end of the week. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining and thank you to our speakers. We'll see you all again soon. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye.